They should be out here somewhere, Doug. It's a beautiful day. This is the perfect spot. We got lots of wildflowers. Now, can you tell me the names of those those beautiful little purple wildflowers? Yeah, the shooting stars. Oh, That's yeah. what these guys love to eat the most. So we're looking for these high, sort of south-facing slopes covered with the, the purple flowers, the shooting stars. And then look at this view. We got the Mission Mountains in the background. We're on an island. We should be able to find them. I know. <laughs> they could go on an island, I know. My name is Doug Emlin. I'm a biologist at the University of Montana, and I study animal weapons. So we've got a group of mule deers up on the hill here a harem of females, and there's a really big male sort of guarding the group and trying to keep all the females together. And then if you're lucky and you look, there's often smaller males sort of sneaking around the side trying to see if they can get a female off away from the group. Actually, you can see it right now. There's a small guy approaching from the side, and the big male came down to intercept. So when people think about animal weapons, I mean, it's easy to think of the, the, the antlers on a moose or the horns on a bighorn sheep. These are sort of the things that most people are familiar with, but the, the real diversity in these weapons lies in the insects. There's something almost magical about the insects because there's so much that we just don't know. I mean, it really is the, the uncharted frontier of the animal world. There's thousands and thousands of species that have never been studied at all. And in my particular case, I fell in love with beetles. God, they're so handsome. So this is an atlas beetle, Chalcosoma atlas. It's a species that lives in the Philippines and parts of Thailand. So these are one of the largest insects in the world. So the head is down here and the eye is down here. So all of this horn is coming off the head. I mean, that's analogous to coming off the top of my head. And then these two really big horns are the equivalent of coming off the shoulder blades. So it really is just like a triceratops, but in a beetle. They love the water because they live in a rainforest normally and they're usually out at night. So they would fly to the sides of trees and feed on sap flows or wounds that leak sap on the side of a tree and do all the battles with rival males over those territories at night, often in the rain. I made the decision to come to Montana and work with Doug. I study uh, stick insects, which is a um, group of insects for which most of the species look like sticks. That's what they are called stick insects, but there is way more diversity than people know about. This is the male thorny devil stick insect uh, from Papua New Guinea. I study these guys because they are an exception in the group of stick insect, because most male stick insects are just much smaller than the, than the female. And in this species, as you can see, I mean, the female is here, the male is there. They're basically roughly the same size. And the males have these enormous hind legs that you don't want to get pinched with because they're extremely strong. And they use these hind legs against other males to fight for groups of females. Leaf insects are the exact opposite of um, species that have weapons. In leaf insects, the males are very small, much smaller than the female. They don't even look like leaves at all. The female look very much like a leaf. The males, no. The males are tiny, they have very long antenna, they can fly, the females can't. This is very interesting to study, you know, why is it that in some species we have the males that have huge weapons and they are much bigger than the females and why is it that in other species it's the exact opposite. So I'm at the Philip Wright Zoological Museum on the University of Montana campus and I love this place in part because of all the animal weapons. Most of the time, the weapons that we study are smaller than this. They're the weapons on beetles. But it turns out that all the biology we've learned from insect and beetle weapons applies to these types of weapons too. So this is one of my favorite examples of animal weapons Montana style. So this is a, a rack from a large bull elk. A rack like this can weigh 40 or 50 pounds. And imagine a bull elk carrying this around on the top of his head. But what amazes me is that the beetle horns are even bigger. 
I mean, relative to the size of the male, the horns on that rhinoceros beetle are bigger than these are to the bull elk that carries them. Even in the largest bull elk, the antlers only weigh about 5% of the total body. These horns, on the other hand, are more like 30% of the body weight. So a third of the weight of that male is allocated into those weapons. So by any metric, these are huge. They're some of the largest animal weapons in the world. Today we're going to Wild Horse Island. We're gonna look for big horned sheep. We're gonna to try to find the rams with the really big horns, but they tend to hang out really high and they're hard to find. We're gonna be joined by a few people from my lab and by Chris Johns, the legendary photographer of the National Geographic. So we put off on this side of the island. The best chances of the sheep are gonna be up on the high cliffs, mm -hmm. sort of the south facing meadows up at the top of these bluffs. It's gonna be steeper and rougher than it looks here. Yeah. <laughs> but I think our best bet is just to walk up this ridge. We'll keep looking both sides and try to stay ahead. And, and the, the best chance is to find them on the next ridge over so that okay. we can creep up and get close, but not too close to actually scare them away. Well, where'd they go, Doug? They should be here. This is the perfect spot. If I was a bighorn sheep, I'd be hanging out there right now, eating some wildflowers, some grass. It's been really fun coming here today. You know, and it reminded me of so many trips where you get on this boat, you're not really quite sure where you're going. I'd never been to Wild Horse Island before. I'm with a renowned biologist which is wonderful because then they can, you can help me see and understand. <laughs> and we then we start going over hill and dale and we're looking for animals, yeah. and specifically bighorn sheep. And I wish I had a dollar for every hour I've spent trying to find an animal to photograph. And we haven't seen them yet, but we will. The day, we're not done yeah, yet. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, exactly. We're not No, but you're right. Yet. I mean, this is really our backyard. It's one yeah. of the amazing things about being here at the University of Montana and in Montana generally is that we can hop in a car and a very short drive and we're out in places like this. And some days we find them and some days we don't, but these kinds of trips are just part of what we do. Well, I, I, I've had the great privilege of traveling all over the world. There's a reason I live in Missoula now. And you just said it. I, I mean, couldn't agree with you We anymore. are an hour from the University of Montana and look at this. What I love, have always loved, is experiential learning. Yeah. And like right here, and, and that's one reason I wanted to be a photographer and eventually a wildlife photographer was that I could have the opportunity and the privilege of sitting there for days, weeks, months, and working with species, learning about them, and having these incredible experiences. And th that's the stuff that doesn't leave you. That's the foundation, really, of, of I think, uh, lifelong learning. Yeah. So this spring is a big part of why I love this place. This is one of the only things around here that's got water all year. There's always water in the spring and it brings all kinds of animals through here. So I've had my trail camera looking at the spring for years now and I get mountain lions coming through to drink. I get elk, I get deer, foxes, skunk, bears. Sometimes we have families of bears. I've had as many as five bears drinking out of this spring at one time. But I also think it's interesting for the history of this place. Because there's standing water here in an area that can otherwise be so dry, especially in the summer, I'm sure that this would have been a really important place for early hunters. Mm -hmm. 
The big surprise was learning, first of all, that beetles tell us something about all of these examples of animal weapons. And then the really, really big surprise was realizing that not only can these weapons teach us about other kinds of animal weapons, they can teach us about ourselves. I mean, everybody knows that our own military technologies can get caught up in arms races, sort of swept into a cycle where nations are racing each other to invest in bigger and bigger and faster and deadlier weapons. The realization that the things that trigger the arms race, that cause the arms race to start, are exactly the same as animals. And that even once these arms races begin, the, the sequence of stages that they go through, so the way that the arms race unfolds, is exactly the same between animals and military technologies. And then even the things that bring about collapse, that cause state-of-the-art weapons to no longer be valuable or cost-effective, those are the same as animals. So the parallel here is that in these systems, sneaky beetles break the rules. Small males that can't afford to produce the really big weapons, they cheat. They don't even try to produce the big weapons. And they sneak up and sneak access to females on the sly. And that is directly, exactly analogous to the, to the national security problem that we face right now with cyber hacking. Because in that situation, you've got sneaky individuals that are worming into our technological systems and hacking into the software that we use. We could spend tens of billions of dollars on a piece of technology like a brand new Gerald Ford class aircraft carrier but it still depends on software to function. And so if people can hack in and break into those systems, they can undermine the effectiveness of our state-of-the-art weapons. And that is exactly what happens in animals. He loves animals so much, whatever, whether it's a beetle, a bird, or anything else. <laughs> I think that could be a bear's lair. The tracks come here. There's scat, scat, scat. And there's an entrance hole. Just in case, I'm gonna get out. <laughs> Many of the pressing issues of our day hinge on an understanding of the science. It's difficult to imagine a time period when science was more critical to everything from our national security to our survival as a species. The way I think most people are thinking about science now is all connected to the coronavirus. How do we know how to treat coronavirus? How do we figure out where it came from? How do we understand how it is evolving? All these people talking about new strains and new variants, that's evolution. That's what I study. This is evolutionary biology. I fell in love with this place the moment I saw those mountains and I've never looked back. I've worked in Africa, South America, Central America, all over the world. We work on beetles from Asia, but we live here. At the end of the day, this is the place I want to come back to.